Maranatha, our Lord is coming. I am Dr. Charles L. Pack of Thy Kingdom Come Ministries, and this is Prophecy Watch, reaching all of North America by satellite and the world through the Internet. With me today is my friend and co-host, Mr. Philip Goodman. Dr. Pack, it's always good to be with you, and friends, it's good to have you with us also. Today, prophecy according to the Bible. Yes, and Phil, in Isaiah 8 and verse 20, it says, To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, there is no light in them. And Phil, we believe that all these prophecies here on this chart have either been fulfilled or they're going to be fulfilled. And so we want now to go to the studio and hear the message by Mr. Goodman. Our world is traveling toward its date with destiny. Signs indicate the last days are drawing near. No one knows the exact date or time, but today's headlines provide evidence that the Earth's time is short. Join us for the next half hour to discover what the Bible teaches us about the future. Welcome to Prophecy Watch. Friends, we're in the Bible today, according to the Bible series we're dealing with, the first part of this series, it, it comes in uh, blocks of four programs each. The first one was uh, Jesus is calling the Jews. The second one was Jesus is calling the Muslims. The third one, Jesus is calling the apostate church. The one we're in today, Jesus is calling the worldly church. We want you to open your scriptures with us and have these ready. Now, before we get into the scriptures, I want to take you to a couple of pictures on the screen that tell us a little something about the worldly church and how it is departing from the Bible. Take a look at that first picture right there. That's pretty graphic. That shows a uh, pastor in a pulpit teaching everything but the Bible. And friends, the essence of what happens when that occurs is that the Bible is set on fire. It is burned. It is destroyed according to that church. Now, we know that the Word of God lasts forever. You can see that in the second picture up there. And this has been a very uh, a dominant theme in the series that we're doing right now according to the Bible. Uh, the Bible actually says, but the word of the Lord abides forever. And Jesus is directing and pointing us as his true body, as his true church, toward the scriptures. Because that's where his word is embedded. And that's where we meet him for, face to face under the power of the Holy Spirit, is through his holy scriptures. Jesus is the living word and the scriptures are the written word and they are one and the same. He cannot... You cannot divide the living word from the written word. The word of God abides forever. The Bible you have today is the same Bible that was promised to us by Jesus. Now take a look at the third picture there. And we have a picture of a Christian, something that every one of us ought to do, going into the scriptures daily, learning what God has to say to us, committing it to their heart in meditation and so forth. Now friends, uh, a far cry from that is this particular paper right here. This is the religion page of the Tulsa world on a particular week. And uh, this comes out on a Saturday and it points uh, people toward the services, the Sunday services on the following day and then all of the religious events of the uh, ensuing week. Uh, this page right here also tells down at the bottom what churches are doing that particular week, what they're talking about, what's on their agenda. Is it the Scriptures? Is it the Word of God? God called us around the Word of God. You know, in Acts uh, chapter 1, it tells us the first church met around the Word of God. And that's what they were commanded to do. Well, that's not what's happening in the majority of churches in the day in which we live. We're living in the era of the worldly church. Jesus even calls it the dead church. I want to give you an idea of what's happening with a um, Baptist church uh, in Tulsa, Oklahoma in this particular week. Nothing in the Bible, nothing in the Scriptures, no sermon topic. What's going on is a series of uh, support groups and topics including self-esteem, healing childhood issues, codependency, grief recovery, divorce recovery, step families, and more of this psychological claptrap, as I would call it, because it is a trap. The Bible warns us of these kinds of traps that are coming upon the world. And there are many other things going on here in these churches. One, they're having a bluegrass group come in. And another one, uh, they're talking about labyrinth patterns and uh, walking meditation on a Sunday and so forth. All of these kinds of things. Now, what is really disturbing about that is, is that when you open up the rest of the newspaper, 
and I know you've had this experience. If not, you need to start paying attention. Open up the rest of your newspaper and see what's going on in the world. You know what's happening? Prophecy is being fulfilled in our day. Not any prophecy. The prophecies of the second coming of Jesus like we've never seen it before. Go all the way back to Genesis. Go through the book of Daniel. Go through the book of Isaiah, Jeremiah, all of the Old Testament prophecies. Come over to Matthew chapter 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, all the book of Revelation, the Thessalonian epistles of Paul. The Bible is saturated with prophecies about the second coming of Jesus with this warning attached. Don't be asleep. Be on the alert. Don't be drunk. Be sober. Talking about spiritually. Be ready. Be ready for the second coming of Jesus. Friends, we are surrounded in the newspaper today with prophecies of the second coming of Jesus. And let me just give you some really ironclad ones that nobody can argue with if they've read the Bible. We're surrounded with the prophecies of the return of Jews to the land. They are returning constantly. The state of Israel has existed uh, since 1948. And we continue to see these alias, that is a return or a going up of Jews from all the countries of the world. That is prophesied throughout Scripture to occur when? Just before the second coming of Jesus. Other prophecies, the return of Jerusalem to the hands of the Jews. You can go over and visit to Jerusalem today. It's under the control of the Jews. And it will be under control of the Jews even in the days of the Antichrist, according to Zechariah chapter 14, although the Antichrist has come in and obliterated another great sign of the day. That is the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. Today the Temple Mount is front page news on your newspapers very, very often in this day and time. Why? Because that Temple Mount contains the Muslims' uh, second, uh, third most holy shrine next to Medina and Mecca. It contains the Muslims' third most holy shrine, and that is the Dome of the Rock. Well, that is the site of the temple which must be rebuilt in the end days. Now, what I'm saying is, while churches are teaching meditation and childhood memories and all of that, the Bible is coming alive on the front page of the newspaper in many, many ways. Israel in the land, Jerusalem in the control of the Jews, the temple on the verge of being rebuilt over there. There's a great temple movement going on. Babylon is coming alive in the, in the Mideast. What is Babylon? Babylon is Iraq. Go to your newspaper. It's all over the pages. Not only is Babylon going to come alive in the end days, it's going to be internationalized, according to the Bible. It's going to become a great economic center. Today, Iraq sets on the second largest pool of oil in the world. All over the newspapers, and we're going to churches, we're going to Sunday school classes and churches and evening church classes that have to do with all of this feel-good stuff that is self-centered. And we're not seeing the Word of God. This is what we call a worldly church or a church in a deep sleepwalk. The very thing that Jesus warned us about in the end days. What else do we see on the newspapers? I want to read you something that's coming out right now. The coming together, it has already come together, of Europe into the European Union for a number of years now, but now they have, got a, they have gotten a constitution. They have written a constitution that is in the process of being adopted by the European states. Listen to the commentaries on this, and why is this so important? I want to tell you the importance before I read the commentaries. When you go to Daniel chapter 2, Daniel 7, you come over to Revelation chapter 13 and 17, you see the revival of the Roman Empire when just prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ. The Roman Empire will come back together. The Roman Empire is in Europe and the Mideast, and it's coming back together rapidly. It is already well on its way. A European constitution. This is a United States of Europe. That's what the Roman Empire is. A United States of Europe is coming back together. It says here, <clears throat> from now on there will, there will be only one European Union replacing the present European communities. And it goes on to say that this treaty establishes a constitution for Europe. Now let's read more about that. It tells us that in this treaty that the voting is going to be weighted. Well, when we read in these passages in Daniel and Revelation, it tells us that the European Union in the end days, the, Roman, the revived Roman Empire is going to come under the power of ten kings. Right now there are 25 nations in the European Union, but that's not a problem. 
because ten of those are going to rise heads and shoulders above the others, and they are going to be the ones who wield the real power. That's already true. Today it's Germany, England, France, Spain, and Italy, and there's going to be more added to that as they get on into the Middle East. There's going to be ten kings who will wield the power over all of those other nations in this revived Roman Empire. Well, I talked about a weighted voting pattern that's already coming to be. Ten will have more voting than the others, more voting power. It's going to be based on population. It says under the new voting rules, measures must have the backing of at least 15 EU states, representing at least 65% of the total population in order to pass. Well, there's 25 there. It's requiring 15 now. At some point, it's going to come down to 10. Now, we read on here about this, uh, uh, these events that are coming alive in our days. Listen to this press release uh, coming out of Spain. Last night, Europe made the greatest leap in its history towards political union. Friends, that's right out of the pages of Daniel and Revelation, right out of the pages of the Bible. Last night, Europe made the greatest leap in its history towards political union. Political union is the revival of the Roman Empire. It goes on to say it made, this, uh, made the greatest leap in its history toward political union when it gave birth to a first constitution for 455 million inhabitants in 25 different countries. The 25 heads of state and government last night approved what is set to be the constitution of the entire continent. A, a very, very important leap in biblical prophecy indeed toward the second coming of Jesus Christ. Another press release here says that it is a decisive moment in the creation of a super state. Friends, that's exactly what the Bible predicts. The revival of the European, uh, of, of the Roman Empire into a super state called the revived Roman Empire. That's what we know it as. And uh, it goes on here. I want to read you something very startling here now. It says the signing will take place in the same room where the original treaties which founded the EU, the European Union, were signed almost 50 years ago. Where is that room? Where is that room that the, this treaty was the first treaty that started what was called the European Common Market and now has evolved into the European Union now with a constitution? Where was that first signing uh, at? In 1957, six nations signed the Treaty of Rome. The Treaty of Rome. Again, that is so important because the Bible predicts ten kings will come out of the old Roman Empire and draw that Roman Empire back together under their authority in the end days. It's called the Treaty of Rome. And it says uh, the, the president of France, uh, Jacques Chirac, said he was satisfied with the decision taken unanimously to sign the Constitution Treaty in Rome, making it the second founding treaty. So it is a repeat of that original treaty in 1957, only now it has really drawn the Roman Empire together, the revived Roman Empire. What we're saying is, is that we're living in the day when churches are teaching and preaching and putting on the kinds of programs that we've seen in this religion page here all over the world. They are asleep to what else is going on in the rest of their newspaper and on the news channels. And that's all of these prophecies that are coming back. Did you know that the Bible says in Ezekiel 37 and 38 that Russia will be a great power in the end days and that it will unite with a, a, many other states who are Islamic in the end days and the uh, Arabic uh, sphere of uh, power and that they will come together and invade Israel in the end days? What are we seeing all over the papers today? We have a super state north of Israel, directly north, as the prophecies declare it must be, called the land of Russia. And all around Israel, it is surrounded by militant Islam ready to drive Israel into the sea, the chosen people into the sea, a prophecy of the last days. Now, I want to show you another startling prophecy. By the way, I'm only taking those prophecies that you can go see, touch, and feel. You can buy an airline ticket to any one of these places. They exist. And you can go over, and you can go over to China right now. Another great prophecy: the kings of the east, China or India, or the Koreas, Japan, Indonesia, all of those, and you'll be buried in people. 
Why is that important? Because in Revelation chapter 9 and 16, it tells us that there will be 200 million uh, army that will be raised out of those. That indicates a population of enormous proportions. It's telling us that there will be a population explosion east of the Euphrates and all of those countries east of the Euphrates. Right here is just a simple uh, human geography book, a cultural geography book, a textbook for college classes. You turn over here, and I don't know if you can see this or not, but I'm going to describe it. This is the weirdest looking map you've ever seen. It doesn't look like a map. Now, it looks like, well, right here's North America, here's South America, here's Europe, and here's the East, but it's distorted. It's not in the right shape. Why is that? It, that's because this map is called a cartogram, a population cartogram. This map is drawn according to the size of population, not according to the size of physical boundaries or physical land. What do you see then according to the size of population? Look over here in the eastern hemisphere, east of the Euphrates. I'm using the Euphrates because in Revelation chapter 16, or chapter 9, it tells us that east of the Euphrates there will be a population explosion just prior to the second coming of Jesus. Look east of the Euphrates. Remember, this map is drawn, the sizes are according to population. That's why India and China are so huge over here. That's why Indonesia is so huge. In the Bible, these are called the kings of the east. It says, just before the battle of Armageddon, they are going to, they're going to cross the Euphrates, and they're coming down to Armageddon at the time that Jesus will return. Well, we live in the only time in history when that population explosion has blown uh, so far out of proportion that this map looks like this, this cartograph map. So friends, this is just another indicator that in a day and time when many churches are teaching worldly behavior and teaching from every other possible source except the Scriptures, when they've set the Bible aside, and yet you go home from church, you turn on the news, and we're hearing all of this biblical information coming out of the secular news, fulfilled prophecy. Prophecies being fulfilled or in the process of fulfillment in our day and time. Friends, something is the matter with today's church. And uh, we need to get back to the Bible. Now, I want to go and uh, ask one of our speakers at the Tulsa International Prophecy Conference. By the way, uh, the Tulsa International Prophecy Conference is hosted by Prophecy Watch Television, Thy Kingdom Come Ministries in Tulsa, Oklahoma, every year around the 1st of April. And we have the world's greatest speakers come, five at a time. Well, one of those, and many of you have heard of him, is Dr. Chuck Messler from Koinonia, Koinonia Ministries. And Dr. Messler uh, uh, spoke with us the last time he was here, and we asked him this question. We said, since 1948, uh, it's been declared that since Israel came back to the land in 1948, Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. Well, 1948 now has been over 50 years ago. Jesus has not yet come back. So what makes today any different? Well, friend, I'm going to comment on this when it's done, too, uh, when he's finished talking. But we want to hear Dr. Chuck Missler tell us if Jesus is really near or not. Is he coming back soon, according to all these signs? Listen to Dr. Missler. Well, first of all, we need to understand that many of these enthusiasts uh, took, of course, a springboard from the passage where Jesus says, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. But they don't listen to Matthew 24 carefully. He goes through a whole series of things, nation against nation and so forth. He says, but the end is not yet, meaning those are not signs. And then he highlights some specific things. Now, the real point, the real issue of that this generation shall not pass is what triggers it. There's nowhere in the passage does it deal with the return of Israel as the trigger, or even of Jerusalem as the trigger? I personally suspect that the trigger he's talking about is the rapture. I believe that passage is very Jewish, because it's his instructions are for those who are in Judea to flee to the mountains, not in Washington, D.C. or Los Angeles. It's specifically directed to a time when those people will see a trigger, and that trigger is, 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 is Jesus points them to Daniel 9. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, that's a fabulous verse because he tells us who wrote the book of Daniel, 
If you, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you know who wrote the book of Daniel. If you don't believe in Jesus Christ, you've got bigger problems than the authorship of Daniel. But the point is, he points to that very trigger. And that trigger had happened two centuries earlier as a historical event, but he's referring to it as yet future, so it's going to happen again. It hasn't happened yet. It will. When that trigger occurs, then uh, th uh, that's the generation. So all that tells me is that the rapture and all the event events subsequent to it will occur within one lifetime, with one generation. With it. And uh, there are other views to that passage that may be correct, but that's mine. Friends, you heard what Chuck Missler had to say. Uh, he said that actually the Bible in that passage that talks about the return of the Jews to the land and everything else, it's talking about the context of one generation. And, but it says many signs have to be triggered there and that those signs are going to be triggered specifically by an event called the abomination of desolation. That's when the Antichrist will go into the temple in Israel. Uh, that will be rebuilt, and he'll set himself up as the God of this world. But that tells us that temple has to be rebuilt. That's just one of the great signs of the end times. But 1948 is not very long ago in the context of all of the time. We're talking about 2,000 years since these prophecies were given. This is only one-fortieth of the slice of all of that time. And Jesus said when these signs begin to happen, as Dr. Messler pointed out here, that there's going to be a generation that will see all of these signs come to fruition. Now, they're coming rapidly to fruition right now. And that generation is going to be the generation that will be caught up in the rapture of the church. That is, the church will be removed from the earth. If you're a true believer, you'll be among that group. If you're not, if you're just a churchgoer in a worldly church, you'll be sitting in the pew when the rapture goes and, and Christians are caught up to heaven. But... Uh, that same generation will uh, will see the rapture and then all of the other signs that will occur, including the second coming of Jesus. Now, I want to give us a little bit of a, con uh, a little bit of context here. Let's take a timeline from my left to my right. Right here, let's say the rapture occurs. At that point, the seven-year tribulation will almost surely begin. And the great tribulation period is the last three and a half years of that tribulation. That's when the Antichrist will rule the whole earth. At the end of that tribulation, Jesus will come back from heaven with all of those that he took up at the rapture, including you and I, if you love the Lord, if you've given your heart to the Lord as your personal Savior. Jesus will come back at that point, and he will come down to the battle of Armageddon, and you and I will be with him. And he will set up his kingdom. He will destroy the armies of the Antichrist and the false prophet, he will destroy the false worldly church that will exist at that time. He will judge all of the nations in a judgment called the judgment of the sheep and the goats. It's called in the Bible. This is the judgment of the nations. Those who have committed their lives to Jesus after the rapture occurred, they had second thoughts. They said, we want to turn our lives over to the Lord also. Many of them will be killed by the Antichrist during that period. But those who survive will be led into the kingdom that Jesus will set up on the earth at that time. You and I coming back with Jesus, we will inherit that kingdom. All of the others, uh, all of the uh, uh, ones who have followed the Antichrist and the worldly church and the apostate church, they will go into hell. That's just what the Bible says. That's not my words. That's the words of the Bible. Matthew chapter 25, verse 46 tells us exactly what will happen right there. And friends, you want to be part of the true church of Jesus Christ because there's coming a time when it's going to be too late. Uh, there's coming a time when it will no longer be possible. I want to read you about that uh, time when it will no longer be possible to make a decision for Jesus. Go with me to Matthew chapter, I mean, excuse me, Mark chapter 13. Let's go to Mark chapter 13. And we're going to see about that time when Jesus returns. Look, look at Matthew, I mean Mark 13, verse 29. Now we're in the book of Mark. I keep saying Matthew. It's the book of Mark. Verse thir uh, chapter 13, verse 29, it says this. Even so, you too, when you see these things happening. What things? All of the things that we just talked about in this program today. The, Israel's ret uh, the Jews return to the land of Israel. They take uh, Jerusalem under their control. They uh, uh, set up a movement to rebuild the temple and actually do rebuild the temple one day. Uh, the Roman Empire comes back together. 
Russia and all the Islamic nations exist, the great population explosion to the Far East, all of these signs that we've talked about today. He says, when you see these things happening, recognize something. This is a command. Recognize that he is near even at the door. So Jesus is standing at the door right now, friends, according to every thing that the Bible has to say about this. He says, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things occur. We're in that generation, friends. He says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But of that day and hour, no one knows. We don't know the day or the hour, but we know that he's near. That's what we are to know. We will never know the day or hour. Of that day or an hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. He's the only one who knows. Take heed, keep on the alert, for you do not know when the appointed time is. Now let's go on down to verse 37. Very succinctly, the Lord says this, And what I say to you, I say to all, be on the alert. Friends, don't be part of this worldly church right here that is studying about self and that is looking into feel-good programs and all that. Be part of a church, and there are churches out there like that that are in the Bible. And the most important thing in the Bible is how to know Jesus as your Savior. Listen to what Dr. Charles Pack has to say about that. Friend, you've heard this message by Mr. Goodman. I'm sure it's touched your heart, particularly if you're not saved. And if you're not saved, you need to do something about it now because the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 2, it says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow, but now. And right now, I want you to receive the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior. And I want you to write and tell us about it. Mr. Goodman, I would like to know that you have been born again and you're on your way to heaven. Now, you may say, well, I'm not sure about all these things. Then we want to send you a little booklet that will help you to understand. It's absolutely free. It's postpaid. And we'll send it to you right away if you accept the Lord as your personal Savior. Remember the verse again. Behold, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Will you do it now? Please do it now. Write and tell us about it. Say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, and save me for Christ's sake. Do it right now, and then write and tell us about it. God bless you.